For those who like to travel and for those who like to cruise, there is a special voyage called the Cruise to Nowhere. The Cruise to Nowhere is a ship that would depart into international waters and will spend a few days there before turning around and going right back where it came from without ever making port in any designated land. That caught my attention this week, not because I'm intending on going nowhere. It's, it's simply because that phrase, cruise to nowhere, do you know anyone who's living life as if they're on board a cruise to nowhere? No aim, no purpose, no direction. Have you felt that? I just kind of feel like I'm meandering through life and there's no clear direction. No clear reason for what it is I'm doing or why it is I'm doing it. One author said this, that when a man does not know what harbor he is making for, no wind is the right wind. And I think that kind of speaks to a lot of people today, that they're aimless. And it doesn't matter what you do or whatever you put towards if you don't know where you're heading. Because, as another person said, the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. The question is, who defines that purpose? Who defines why it is that I am here on earth? Is it, is it me? Is it my friends or my family or society? There was a book written in 1988 called The Meaning of Life According to the Greatest, Our Century's Greatest Writers and Thinkers. The irony is one of the Amazon reviews said there wasn't a lot of meaning in this book. Or at least he didn't understand the meaning. Maybe you remember the book The Purpose Driven Life that sold over 40 million copies. We all want to know, why am I here? Why am I here? What am I to do with this life that I have? We, we, we have been looking this year at our theme, Speak, O Lord, which we just sang. We're walking through phrase by phrase to this beautiful hymn, and our phrase for this month is, Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Do, do you hear the plea in that phrase? It's not, I have to search and work and, and, and seek and discover my meaning somewhere in this world. Or I have to dig down deep and find my purpose deep within me. It's, Lord, I am seeking and pleading for you to help me understand your purpose for my life. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. I love what one paraphrase says. It says, For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him, and notice, and finds its purpose. In him. If, if there is one above all others who is qualified to speak with truth and clarity as to why I am here on this earth, it's our God. That's where I need to be looking, and that's the plea of the song and ought to be the plea of our life. Now, if you've got your little hand out, we're going to have some notes right in the middle because one thing we're going to be looking for as a roadmap for our study today purpose is made up of two equally important components. Purpose is built and maintained on direction and determination. Where am I going and what is motivating me in that direction? We're going to look at it this way. The purpose is the planning the work, that's our direction, and the working the plan. And that's what I want us to consider this morning, how God is the one who is able to define the direction and the determination for our lives. And so we're we'll start with the first one. What direction is, is God aiming and, and pointing us towards in this life? What is our God defined purpose in this life? And there may be a lot of things we could put on that. I think to begin, we might say our God given purpose in life is to belong. To belong. God did not make us to be Lone Ranger Christians, meant to make our mark on the world all by ourselves. God made us to belong, He made us to belong to Him. And so in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says that he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He predestined us to adoption. It's not that God said, I'm going to give you my son and remove your sins and send you on your way. It was always God's plan to pull us into an intimate relationship with himself. And he used, of all words, adoption. You're going to wear my name. 
You're going to share in my inheritance. You're going to live in my home. You're going to sit at my table. You belong to me. You are now part of my family. Can we hear that for a moment? God's purpose for every one of us is that we live this life walking with him. It's not independent. It's not apart from our creator. It's side by side. Paul would also say that as we obeyed this gospel, it's not that God brought us into an intimate relationship with him. He also brought us into a close relationship with all saved people. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are members of the household of God, a close relationship with all saved people. Now, here's our challenge. We have a lot of young people here. So glad that you're you're here. The singing was great and the worship was special, being being able to worship side by side with you today. There's a challenge for a young generation that's going on today. Our family here may remember in January, we had Jarrett Ferguson with us for a blast weekend, and he shared with us this study about this open generation, how teens around the world relate to Jesus. And what was decided and discovered in this study, here's kind of what the conclusion said. It says, though religious affiliation and church attendance continue to decline, spiritual openness and curiosity are on the rise. Across every generation, in fact, we see an unprecedented desire to grow spiritually, a belief in the spiritual or supernatural dimension, and a belief in God or a higher power. Here's what he's saying. There's something really positive in the young generations, and that is an increasing interest in God, wanting to be close and right with God. There's also something negative in this quote. Did you catch it? While there is an increasing interest in God, there is an increasing uninterest in God's people in his church. I want God. I don't want the church. I want the Lord. I'm just not really interested in doing things with his people. He made us to be a people. He made us members of one another. He made us to be people who live life side by side with one another. And and you think of all of the good and the blessings that come simply because God brought us together. The help, the encouragement, the strength, the instruction, the warning, the comfort, the guidance. Paul would say, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up and do all aspects into him who is the head. Even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by, by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part. Not our older members, not our seasoned saints, every single part, every single saint, young and old, working together, it causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. What is Paul saying? We can do far more together, collectively and individually, than we ever could on our own. In terms of what this church will become, and in terms of what we will become, it is greater together. Maybe look at this another way. Have you ever thought about what we become in terms of our own mature walk in Christ because of our relationships with one another? Think about a passage like in Colossians 3, when Paul would say, and so as to those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. How do you learn compassion? It's not from reading a book, I'll tell you that. You learn compassion by learning to love and care for others. How do you learn kindness? By selflessly doing good. Selfless goodness in the lives of others. How do you learn humility? It is literally putting you before me. Little in my own eyes, as our brother Ricky would define, and you are great in mine. How do you learn gentleness if it's not but being touched inwardly and displayed outwardly, outwardly with great sensitivity towards one another? How do we learn patience and bearing with one another if it's not a willingness to wait? I'm going to wait on you, and I'm going to wait with you, and I'm going to endure with you through the hardships. That's a relationship that's given there. How do we learn forgiveness if it's not even when I'm wounded and hurt and betrayed by those who love me, I'm going to be willing instead to respond with anger and bitterness. I'm going to choose to let it go. I'm going to choose to respond with mercy and kindness and release the debt. We don't learn these things except and apart from one another. The beauty is, thinking of this, is that so many of us got to see and taste the beauty of what God did here yesterday. Over 100 young people gathered last night for the banquet that was offered in this town. 
over a hundred young people in this one place in this one time who shared the same faith in God, the same desire to please Him, the same care and love and respect for one another. And I know there are some of you who came out of this weekend and you were thinking, this is what I needed. I'm not alone in my faith. I'm not alone in my convictions. The strength and encouragement of knowing there are some just like me who have the same goal of honoring King Jesus. Also yesterday, in a small town, gathered in a small cemetery, were saints who remembered the life of Marie Jenkins. And there was mourning, and there was grief, and there was a lot of tears. But there was immense hope and victory that filled that small space. Can you see that whether if it's rejoicing with those who rejoice or weeping with those who weep, can you see the wisdom of God who understands it's better to live life together? God made us to be a people who need people. God made us to live life walking with him and walking with each other. My God-given purpose is to belong. Let's keep going. My God-given purpose is to worship. Right here in Psalm 96, look at how it begins in Psalm 96 and verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. You notice it's not a suggestion. God is commanding his people are to sing his praises. Have you ever wondered why? Why does God command us to worship him? Why does God want our worship? It's not that he needs it. Paul made it very clear that God doesn't need anything. There, there's nothing that God is deficient in that I can add and I can contribute to. That's not the reason we worship God. We worship God because he commands it. We worship God because he is worthy. And we worship God, Psalm 147 and verse 1 says, because it is good. It is good to sing praises to our God. Right here, you have your Bibles open in Psalm 96. Let's see why it's good to sing praises to our God. Let's see why it's good, why it is woven into our purpose to worship God. First of all, because worship directs our attention. Verse 4. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Worship directs our attention. It directs it off of the world, off of distractions like school and work and what's trending and hot. It takes our attention off of our idols. It directs our attentions off of ourselves. And it puts it totally, completely, and wholly on the Lord. I don't know if it's happened to you. It has happened to me far too often. When something happens, usually it's the bad things, the accidents, the blinking lights, and you take your eyes for just a minute off of the road. It's amazing how fast you begin to drift where you don't need to be. I got a car who does it for me naturally now. I think it just knows Jordan's going to be on autopilot today. I'm going to help him get where he needs to go. When we keep our eyes focused, when we keep our eyes ahead, we stay where we belong. Worship directs our focus, and thus worship directs our life. It keeps us where we belong. Also in our context, worship draws us near. Verse 8, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his court. Some versions will say the glory do his name. Worship draws us near because we are thinking of God. We're singing to God we are praying, thus speaking literally to the Lord in prayer. And right now, we have come gathered. You are not here to hear the words of Jordan Shafts. We are hearing God speak through his words. It draws us near to him, and thus worship declares the faith we have in him. Verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. We say to each other, and we say to the world, the people here who are bending in prayer, who just ate and drank the Lord's Supper, the people here who are singing these songs, who are listening to this word, we believe in, we trust in, our hope rests entirely in the one true and living God. Our worship declares our faith. One of my favorite uh, quotes from years ago, an author said, I need to worship because without it I can forget that I have a big God beside me and live in fear. I need to worship because without it I can forget his calling and begin to live in a spirit of self-preoccupation. I need to worship because without it I lose a sense of wonder and gratitude and plod through life with blinders on. 
I need to worship because my natural tendency is towards self-reliance and stubborn independence. Do you hear what he's saying? I need to worship because worship reminds me just how much I need my God. We were made to worship. It's our purpose. We were also made, our God-giving purpose is to become, to become just like our God, to become more like him. I had a friend earlier this year, and he sent me a podcast saying, you, you got to listen to this. That was the greatest thing there. So I listened to the podcast. The crux of the message of this podcast, the guy was saying was, be true to yourself. The ultimate calling in life of what God wants for his people is authenticity. Be true to who you are and true to yourself. It's not new. Have you heard messages like that before? Listen to your heart. A dream is a wish your heart makes. Follow your dreams, follow your plans. Do you know what the problem with that is? Be true to yourself is not what Jesus called us to be or to do. If anyone wishes to come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself. Deny himself. And to take up his cross, his willingness to sacrifice everything daily. And it's not follow your plans, follow your dreams, follow your ambitions, follow who you are and your truest self. No, you deny yourself, you take up your cross, and you follow me. Follow me. That's the message. Did you hear how we sang that? Lord, I lay my life at your feet, all my plans, my hopes, and my dreams. At the cross where you gave your life for me, Lord, I lay my life at your feet. That's what this is about. My plans, my ambitions, my dreams, my will, who I am, I'm denying all of that. And the call of God, even from the very beginning, is that we would be conformed to the image of his son, to think the way Jesus thinks to speak the way Jesus speaks, to build my priorities and the aim and direction of my life the way that Jesus would. Because there is a fundamental difference between being true to yourself and denying self and following Jesus. There may be parts of my life right now that are not a lot like Jesus. Maybe it's pride or selfishness, anger and jealousy. Being true to myself says I'm going to admit my faults. I'm going to speak my truth and share my, share my weaknesses where I am today. But following Jesus compels me not to share and to speak my weaknesses, but to confront them and change them. I cannot stay who I am and follow Jesus. I have to be willing to change. Following Jesus takes us not down the easy path of life, but down the narrow road. And sometimes that road is full of suffering. Being true to myself, I'm going to avoid that path. I'm going to avoid awkward situations. I'm going to avoid suffering. I'm going to afford, avoid persecution and confrontation. But Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, you've got to be willing to deny that fear. You've got to be willing to deny that self-driven, self-preservation, self-defense mode, and you have to be willing to follow me, even if it's out on the waves. I want you to follow me even if it's into the deep, dark valleys of life. I want you to follow me even if I want you to walk through the fire itself. Peter says, you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving for you an example to what? Follow in his steps. I'm going to follow you even if it means I lose it all, even if it costs me greatly, even if I suffer. I'm not preserving myself. The call of God is not be true to yourself. The call of God is deny yourself. And all the more become like the one who made you. Become like Jesus. We could say our purpose is to serve. I love the language from Peter in 1 Peter 4 verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. One person commented on this and said, The purpose of life is to discover your gifts. The meaning of life is to give your gifts away. I love that language, don't you? The purpose of life is to discover your gifts. The meaning is to give them away. In other words, we have been blessed to bless. We have been given in order to give. I mean, think of that. Think of that in terms of all the goods we have, the material, physical goods, all the money and all the wealth and all the possessions. How Paul would say that uh, Timothy was to instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. 
instruct them to do good and be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. What's he saying? What's the, the purpose of all the goods that God has given to us? To enjoy them? Yes, but how do you enjoy the gifts God has given to us? When we use them for good. Brethren, the times we enjoy our wealth and our prosperity the most are not when we build our mansions and our fences and go on our lavish vacations. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the goods that God has given you for yourselves, but the greatest joy that comes from the goods that we have received is when we give them and when we use them for others. You think about it in terms of our talents. Paul said, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, look, use them. Use them. Use what God gave you. God gave you a mind that can think and can organize and put it together. Use it. Use it. God gave you hands that can build and fix and work and mold. Use it. God gave you a tongue and and a voice that can speak or sing or teach or instruct. Use it. God gave you a heart that can listen and sympathize and care for. Use it. I think one of my favorite pictures in all the Psalms, Brother Jess Jenkins pointed this to me years ago. In Psalm 84, it paints the picture of the righteous heading towards the presence of God. And it says in Psalm 84 and verse 5, Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways designed. You get that? In the heart of the people of God is God's presence, and that's where I want to go. I'm heading, I'm pressing on to the very presence of God. Keep going. As they go through the valley of Baca, this dry and desolate place, they make it into a place of springs. Do you get the picture? As the people of God journey from here to home, to the very presence of God, we bless the road we travel. God's purpose is not to give us gifts, simply to give us gifts. Not to squander them, not to use them selfishly, not to hide them or to sit on them. God gave us gifts to use them for good, for his good. That we might turn the desolate, dry places of this earth into something beautiful. This is not about earth itself. This is about people. At the broken and weary hearts we encounter, we can bless and encourage and strengthen. God gave us gifts. I don't know what gifts he gave you. But to every one of us, God has given us what we have to be used, to bless others. Because ultimately, our purpose in life is to go. As we have given, been given in order to give, as we have been blessed in order to bless, we as disciples are given the mission to make disciples. Disciples who make disciples. There's a quote that came out years ago that said, God's people are not museum pieces placed and anchored on a shelf to collect dust. We are alive, moving, and active people called by him to make an impact on the world that isn't quite sure which end is up. But to do that, we need to determine our priorities. You kind of get that language? Not once did God ever say, you as my people are the statues in my museum, there to, for me to display your glory. No, we are called living stones built up in his temple, which means we are called to go. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. If you thought of this, God did not merely take his truth and put it into the hearts of every person in this world. How does the world get the truth today? It's us. It's us. We are the world's Bible. We used to sing in that old hymn. We are the ones who carry forth the gospel. We are the ones who speak the truth. We are the ones pointing this world back to our God. Now, purpose is made up of two components, remember? There's direction, where we had, but then there's the determination, the motivation that fuels us forward. And for the people of God, our one central desire, our one central thing, point, that propels us forward is the glory of God. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Whatever you do, Paul says, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Can you just walk that through with me and see that on that page before you? Belonging to one another 
It's not, I'm going to belong so long as they're good for me, so long as they have good things for my kids and good Bible classes for my kids, so long as the brethren are kind to me and encourage me and invite them to their house. All that we do as a church is to the glory of God. To him be glory in the church, not to me. It's not about me. In our worship, I'm not here to be entertained. And so the extent of great worship is not that I came out feeling a certain emotion or being stirred or singing the songs that I like or hearing the preaching that really encourages or builds me up. It's not about me. I came to bring my offering to the Lord. And so as the psalmist says, it's not to us, O Lord. This morning is not to us, but to your name give glory. This is about God today. It's not about me. Whether I feel a certain emotion, whether if I feel stirred, whether if I think this was successful or not is not the determining factor. It's giving God the glory and the praise that he belongs, that he deserves to become. It's not that I become more like Jesus so I can boast and brag about all that I have achieved, all that I know, all the ways now that I am spiritually mature, as Paul would say, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but with, that with all boldness, Christ, notice, Christ shall now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by whether by life or whether by death. That caught last night in my throat. Because we've had some recently who have passed through the veil glorifying God. And we have some family members right now who are fighting. They are fighting hard to hold on to that delicate string between life and death. And it is our prayer that God will give them healing and victory. But I will tell you what I have seen. As our loved ones right now who are facing diseases and cancers and situations, they are not complaining about how hard their life is. They have not lost their faith and have turned their back on God. But instead, they are glorifying their God, whether if it is life or whether if it is death. It's not about me. It's not about my name. It's not about good things in my life. It is about the God who gave me life. Life or death, God is going to be magnified and glorified in me. In my service, it's not about me. It's not that people see and recognize all the things that we do. And so, no, we don't boast. We don't share. We don't brag. We don't call attention to the good that we have done. Even if we seek by humble means and honest means to encourage people to serve, We don't have to tell people we have served. Our work will speak for itself. And what our work ought to say is the greatness and the glory of the God who has given us the opportunity to do so. Our light is going to shine in such a way that people will see the work and not glorify Jordan Shouse. They're not going to glorify this church, but they are going to glorify God. And even to the saving of souls, any soul that obeys the gospel, it is not to the glory of this church. It's not to the glory of your preachers. It's not to the glory of your elders. And it's not to the glory of any person who has sat down and shared with them the gospel. It is to the glory of God. Romans 1 and verse 5 says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. I like one verse and said it this way. That through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. Every time a soul is saved, it is not to the glory of this church. We don't keep tabs or numbers here. It's all to the glory of the God who gave his son to save it. There's a really unique mountain in Glacier National Park. It is called the Triple Divide Peak. What's unique about this mountain is that the water that flows from its top every time it rains flows in three distinct directions. And so the water could flow to the north up the Hudson River uh, or up the uh, Nelson River and empty into the Hudson Bay and eventually into the Arctic Ocean. It could flow to the west down the Columbia River and empty into the Pacific Ocean 
Or it could flow to the south, down the Mississippi River, into the Gulf of Mexico, and eventually into the Atlantic Ocean. It's the only place on earth where from one central point, water flows into three distinct oceans. When you look at your life, there are a lot of places we could go. There are a lot of paths that we can pursue. There are a lot of roles that we might fill. There are a lot of endeavors that we might pursue. Especially for all of our young people here this morning, our high schoolers, our juniors and seniors, you're right on the cusp of making some major life choices in terms of occupation and relationships and pursuits in life. There is one central point that must influence and direct all that I do and all the places that I go and all of who it is I would ever become. One central point that affects and influences all of it. And that is my God-given purpose to do His work He created me to do for His glory. What is my purpose on earth? Do God's work for God's glory. Moms and dads, if we're directing our kids, this is it. No matter where you go, no matter what you become, you have one central thing you must achieve to do the work of God for His glory. We direct them there not with our words, we direct them by our example. Are we pursuing the one main thing? There's a lot, of way, a lot of names it's called, the lists that we have. The most common name for it is the bucket list. Things you want to do before you kick the bucket, I believe is where that came from. And there may be a lot of things on your list. I've got things on mine. Places you want to go, things you want to see, things you hope to accomplish. The reality is not one of us may actually accomplish or achieve anything on that list. We may not go the places we want to go or to see the things we've longed to see. We may not ever achieve the things that are high on our dreams. And yet, if what is said of us was what was said of David, that we serve the purpose of God and our own generation, we would have lived a meaningful and successful life. I may not be remembered in the books of history. I may not get a college degree. I may never, ever get married. I may not ever have kids. I may not ever leave this country. I might not ever leave the state of Texas. No need for an amen. (laughs) I may not do all the things that it is I wish and set out to do, but good brethren, if I simply serve the purpose of God, I've done it. I've done what God created me to do. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. It is God's purpose that we live life with Him, side by side with Him, that we walk with God today so we will live with Him in eternity. And if you are here this morning and you know that you have not started your walk with God, then that is your God-given purpose. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, if you are willing to turn from your sins, to leave them behind, if you are willing to confess Jesus as your Lord and to wash them away in baptism today, this very moment, the adoption process takes place and you leave your child of God in his family. And if you have not made that choice, the Father is calling you, come. Today is the day. Now is your moment. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.